Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Insurance Business TV, brought to you in association with Travellers Europe. Uh, today, we're going to zoom in on the tech market, but with a difference. Uh, think tech and insurance, and we're often talking about insure tech and whether it's going to disrupt or benefit the industry. But what about insurance for technology companies themselves? Uh, yes, with new technologies popping up on almost a daily basis, this is, needless to say, a market with massive opportunities for brokers. But what's been happening in the market and what makes a good policy? Well, to bring us up to date, I'm delighted to welcome Dan Brown, Senior Technology Underwriter at Travellers Europe. Uh, Dan, welcome to IBTV. Hi, Paul. Thanks very much uh, for that intro. It's great to be here. So, yeah, looking forward to our chat. Yeah. So, Dan, let's set the scene. Um, give us your overview on the current tech insurance market, how it's developed over the last, say, 12 or 24 months, and, and particularly, of course, with COVID in mind. In terms of the tech PR market, I'd say it's probably halved in pockets. You know, so tech cases with claims, for example, or a lot of US exposure have probably seen rate increases. Certain parts of the industry as well, like, like firms providing biometric services, cyber services, managed service providers, they've all probably seen the market harden a lot more than the average tech customer. Um, so it's a bit of a tailor to two halves really in terms of the tech PI. Um, for larger companies, probably harden more than at the smaller end. And certainly talking to brokers, the excess layer PR, PR market is quite tricky at the moment. It's been hard sort of during the pandemic years to fill up towers. Um, yeah, is that going to continue? Probably yes at the moment due to all the economic uncertainty and things like inflation on the horizon as well. Um, if you move away from PI and look at cyber, well, you know, the cyber market, everyone knows, is quite hard at the moment. And that's, that's no different really for, for tech customers. So limits in general tend to come down, racing up, excesses up, all the usual Alongside that in cyber, you've probably got a lot of changes to wordings in terms of conditions across all carriers, really, from cyber minimum standards of security being inserted into wordings or, or log 4 j exclusions, vulnerability exclusions. So I've got a lot of sympathy for brokers because it's moving very, very quickly and uh, they've really got to keep their eye on the ball. Yeah, it's amazing how, how rapidly things are developing. I mean, what do you see then as the, the key exposures uh, for tech customers and, and what cover options should they be looking for? You know, the main cover that people buy tends to be professional indemnity and that tends to be contractually driven for tech firms. So their, their customers are going to demand that they buy that insurance. So it's slightly different to some of the other PI classes your brokers are listening and will be buying. And um, you know, the limits they buy might well come down to that contract as well. If you think about the key exposures within that PI, really the main ones tends to always be breach of contract because a tech firm's main exposure is going to be their customer alleging they haven't delivered what's on, what that was promised under contract. It was late, too expensive, or they just don't like what they ended up with, for example. Um, and that's different perhaps to other PI classes um, because no one has to prove negligence in that kind of scenario. They can just go straight to the fact that they had a contract for something, it's not been delivered, and they're very, very unhappy. Now, if you think about the world where it is at the moment in terms of you know, potential recessions for the COVID years as well, quite, quite tough. Um, the exposure for tech firm there has certainly increased because uh, you know, in recession years, you get far more fee disputes and that's something that would be covered under a tech PI policy as well. A fee dispute would be, you know, the end customer getting bored for implementation, for example, and wanting to exit it. That's quite difficult to do under contract unless perhaps you allege that you're not really happy with the way that it's going. So it can be far quicker to bring a tactical fee dispute and try and end up in court to exit a contract and sort of pay the penalty to get out of it. Uh, certainly through the COVID years, yep, we were getting far more of those, particularly in the US. Um, that might well have tailed off a little bit now, but you know, read the papers this morning, the inflation news, if we end up in a recession, then you think those sort of claims are gonna increase. Um, so they'd be the main sort of bits under the breach of contract to think about. And then I guess the other uh, side to that would be um, yeah, IPR, a lot of uh, tech companies' uh, valuation is, is brought up in their own intellectual property. So you'd be looking for a PI policy to give you wide, broad cover for intellectual property disputes as well. And, uh, you know, in terms of when brokers are looking at those wordings, really try and drill down to detail of what you're getting in that insuring clause. So, for example, does it cover trade secrets? Does it cover, uh, you know, uh, what are wide territories as well? Um, because 
you'll find that as tech companies expand, which they tend to do very, very quickly, you know, the stock might move overseas and the hazard on a case can, can, can change kind of from one month to the next, really. So I'd encourage brokers to kind of stick close to clients, understand what their plans are, and then really try and use the context of where that company is going to, to think about how to structure their insurance. Yeah, and I've heard you, of course, you know, you mentioned a few times already about PI and cyber. And of course, it's it's, it's vital here, isn't it, that, that they're looking for the right cover. I mean, for example, if you are, you know, processing lots of data that belongs to somebody else, I mean, would that come under PI or would it come under cyber cover? Yeah, that's a great question and a lot of sympathy really for, for insurance folks on this because we don't make it easy for them as an industry because I think every insurer calls it something different. So uh, that, that's certainly tricky. Um, I think conceptually, yeah, we think you know, technology has moved from a, a situation where someone sends you a box in the post. If you take a company like Sage, the accounting software company, they'd be mailing out some boxes in the old days you load up onto your computer. That, that market's been and gone now. It's been replaced by companies like into its QuickBooks, you know, software as a service or a platform as a service where they're hosting that data. So the whole industry, tech industry has moved towards, you know, cloud-based solutions where they're on for all that data. And, you know, insurance-wise, we've got to make sure that, you know, we're covering that uh, properly. The travelers, we cover cyber liability in its own tower. It's very explicit where that cover uh, lies. So if the tech firm loses the data or it gets corrupted, there's some kind of issue on that, that's where that, that's going. Other markets might blend that cover in with the professional indemnity line. So you know, you're not going to find that under the cyber policy because they might exclude professional services. Um, and it's in one tower with the PI. Now that might create a problem after the claim because your professional indemnity cover has been eroded. You think back to how tech companies contract with their customers, they'll probably have minimum PI cover requirements within their contract. So having that limit, limit eroded could be problematic as well. So, you know, it's a Tricky market, uh, but I'd definitely say the only real solution, unfortunately, is to, to read everything in a lot of detail and you know, talk to the underwriters involved just to make sure you're happy with how that scenario plays out. Yeah, I think you've given us a, a great overview so far, but this is the, the portion of the, the programme where I'd like to sort of uh, tap into your expert knowledge, if you don't mind. So so what tips do you have for, for tech companies who are looking to you know contractually manage their risks? Sure. I mean, so in terms of what we look out for as an underwriter, I think... Overall, you're looking to understand how a customer contracts, how they interact with their customers, what they're willing to accept, what they won't accept, and kind of read that, the mood of them, if you like, and, and where their contractual red lines are. Um, and, and a lot of this is in the context of the limit you're putting out, how big that company is, perhaps how hazardous the, the product is in general. But you're looking for sensible contractual liability caps. So you don't want them pegged to the insurance value because that, that could be very problematic for everybody, uh, particularly me. And, uh, you know, if you're looking potentially to cap at the value of the services they provided or a multiple of that. So that gives you a really great starting point in the event of a claim. So if you imagine, fast forward to a claim dispute situation, um, we're going to start reserving at that contractual liability cap. So you don't want that to be insurance value. Um, and then, you know, kind of work from there. So multiple of annual fees or the fees received in the last 12 months, that's probably a good good place to be. I guess the other kind of watch out would be not to put the cap too low that it's seen as ridiculous in court and then the whole thing could get thrown out and then effectively it becomes uncapped. Um, I guess the other thing we've seen really over the last few years, going back to data breaches, is quite often customers will try and carve out data breach from the cap. So either it has its own cap or it would be unlimited. And that's unfortunately getting more and more normal now. Um, you know, and it's ultimately quite hard for tech companies to contract around that, but I guess it's up to us to our underwriters to really understand that situation and, and, and put the right terms on it. And the other thing you tend to find around data breach, getting slipped in is indemnity paragraphs to state exactly what everyone has to do at the point of a breach, and they can be quite onerous and problematic. So yeah, where possible, try and try and push back on that type of thing. And the other standard thing is you expect the tech customer to be able to do is exclude loss of profit. So you know, if my software service fails, we're not going to be paying your, your customer's lost profit. Uh, and also um, there's a consequential loss as well. So that kind of knock on a domino effect, you want that excluded out of contract. Um, and other popular things would be dispute res resolution clauses because they're easily missed. You know, but that's a great thing to have in the contract. And try and make sure it states where that, that resolution has to happen because it's far cheaper to do that in the UK than it would be in Delaware or 
so it's little or whatever fantastic places our, our claims team gets sent that, that I don't. So, um, you know, that would be my kind of top tips around that, really. But in terms of underwriting it and working with a broker, we're really just trying to understand that the insurer's attitude to contracting, you know, and then how they use legal advice throughout that process. A lot of the bigger companies might have in-house legals. Smaller firms might have their own favourite local law firm that they, they can talk to. So let's extend those top tips out, if you don't mind, Dan, um, and let's zoom in on the brokers as well, because obviously it's going to be vital for them to establish relationships, partnerships with these tech clients. So what added value can they bring? What do they need to be emphasising here? Well, I think, yes, brokers have got a great role in kind of explaining some of the pitfalls to their customers, you know, and also they're bringing us in so that we can form a kind of freeway relationship with their customer. And I really understand the detail of what a tech company does the ultimate downside of their services failing looks like in terms of the knock-on effects of their own customer. So, you know, this uh, trading software platform, for example, you know, does, that, does its failure mean that people suddenly can't execute, execute trades? So we can understand the kind of reality of the situation after after an outage, but then also the contractual side of it as well, and what a likely claim dispute looks like. And we really, yeah, it's great that brokers can help us, you know, get under the skin of a business, meet the client, and spend time with them to figure all that out to be able to underwrite a package off the back of that meeting. And also brokers have got a great job to do in terms of educating customers on the importance of multi-factor authentication across the business, important detection, you know, because the cyber landscape is changing so fast. You know, it's hard for everyone to keep up, you know, customers included. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to tap into you one last time uh, for one final tip. Um, just for our broker audience that are watching out there, if you could leave them with sort of one thought, one key message, one takeaway for dealing with these tech clients, uh, for reaching them as well, uh, what would that message be? Well, I think it's absolutely great sector to work in. I really, really enjoy it myself. You know, it's fast paced and exciting. The end customers are really, really interesting. You know, quite often when you meet them, get a glimpse into the future and it's just so it's about, about working in it. I guess the one takeaway I'd say is a lot of people might listen to this think it's a very London-centric industry. It certainly isn't. And whilst we've got London Tech Week coming up in June, in Birmingham last uh, October, there was a similar event. There's big award ceremonies going on in Manchester, big tech expo um, just in March in Manchester as well. So really, whatever city you're in, in Britain and Ireland, there'll be something going on that brokers can attend to start meeting these customers, networking and building up contacts. So, you know, a really vibrant, exciting uh, industry. And I'd just say, like, get involved because you won't regret it. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely is the, the industry to watch without a doubt. Uh, thank you very, very much for all those tips, Dan. And uh, I think you've given everybody watching a lot to work with. Uh, huge thanks to you and to Travelers Europe as well. And while Dan is, of course, the man to turn to for all things uh, tech insurance related, if you want the latest updates on the insurance market in general, then there's only one place to be. And that's right here on Insurance Business TV.